Okay, good morning, everyone. And uh, this is the first in the new series of um, tutorials, Kawasa and Operators Without Borders, uh, Wastewater Tutorial Number One. And our tutor today is Mr. Mike Gosling out of Canada. And I will allow him to introduce himself. So this is going to run for 12 weeks. And uh, <clears throat> I have already circulated most of the, the presentations. So you can always get a review them before the session, which will enable you to retain even better as Mike goes through them with you. And feel free to put your questions in the chat room. Remember to keep your phones, um, your, your devices uh, muted during the presentation. If you have questions, put them, please put them in the chat room. And I'm sure Mike will be happy to answer. And as we go along, if there are questions, you know, he will take on the questions as well as uh, we try to avoid as many interruptions. Of course, we're recording this and for your benefit, you can always review them as you do your studies. So all the best with that. Over to you, Mike. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hope everybody's doing well today. Um, I'm gonna share my screen in a minute. I just wanted to touch base on, uh, you know, we're here for a wastewater treatment exam prep level one and two course. Um, my name is Mike Gosselin. I'll be with you for the next 12 weeks. I'm in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, currently, I'm the wastewater operations manager for the city of Kelowna, so manage uh, a couple treatment facilities, all the linear assets, some vac trucks, uh, uh, that, about 50 staff. Um, before that, uh, I, you know, a few years back, I started, I went to school for uh, water and wastewater, started in the wastewater field, worked uh, at several different plants and uh, as an operator, uh, well, first off as a summer student, then an operator, and then uh, lead hand, working my way up to supervisor and then manager. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to share some uh, information that uh, you find valuable. When we uh, go through this course, it's an exam prep course, so I'm going to be um, may or may not touch on every single slide that that you have uh, the information for, but uh, all the information is important. I'm going to try and focus on what's you'll find important, what you need to know for the exam as I go through. Uh, we also might bounce around a little bit on the slides, so we're not just so we can cover the topics fully and so you can get the most bang for your buck for your information. Um, I'd like to take a minute and uh, just if you could type some information in the chat. I'm just wondering um, what the group is, what the group's here for today. Are you preparing to write a level one exam, a level two exam? Uh, is this just general interest? Um, so I'm just kind of curious if people can, we can check, test out the chat function and just, uh, Everybody could uh, type something in there for a minute. That'd be great. So I got one level one exam. Okay, great. So I see why most of the chat, everybody, or the majority of the people are, are here to prep for a level one exam. So that, that's awesome. It helps me focus a little bit on, on the uh, courses. Uh, some general interest. Okay, that's perfect. Well, thank you very much for putting that information in. I appreciate it. So we'll, uh, we'll get going. Normally we would, uh, if it was face-to-face -face, uh, instruction, we'd spend a little more time uh, getting to know one another and have people introduce themselves and uh, where they're from and the type of facilities they work at, but it's a li little harder on a remote session. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and, and we'll get we'll get started this morning. Um, we're here for about two and a half hours or so this morning. Okay. So hopefully everybody can see my screen that's up there now. 
Yes, screen is up. Perfect, thank you. So the, the exam prep courses, you know, they're based on uh, preparing you to write a, a level one or two exam. And these exam standards are, you know, North American standards. I'm assuming that you'll probably write the ABC exam. Um, remember that the standards that we're going to discuss in this course are based on what the exam is founded on. So it, some of the information may or may not be exactly what you do or how you do it in your jurisdiction, but we're basing it on the exam to prepare you to pass the exam. So we're going to be touching on, uh, you know, some background knowledge. We got to talk about math a little bit, applied sciences, safety. Uh, you need to be able to identify some equipment, uh, not limited to, but pumps, motors, engines, fittings. Um, operators are expected to be familiar with these operations. Okay? Detailed maintenance of equipment, detailed operations of equipment. We're not covering in this course. You get those from manuals uh, from equipment suppliers. And, um, that type of thing. The exam is also being able to demonstrate the knowledge of the day-to-day -day operation of the system. So being able to take a look at a system, highlight when there's an issue, what, what might be happening. And operators are expected to know how to operate this equipment. Also going to be touching a little bit on supervision, finance, communication, site security, information systems, and emergency response. When you prepare to write the exam, um, these these some of these uh, items are may not be things you deal with in a normal day to day basis, but they're fairly reasonable um, questions on the exam, and there's usually quite a few. Uh, quite a few questions that are easy answers to answer. Now I'm just trying to hear it. So just making sure we're uh, okay. Just have to check my screen, bear with me two seconds. Okay. And at the end of uh, this course, we'll, be, we'll provide a confirmation test and 70% uh, chance or pass mark for that multiple choice uh, test. You'll be able to get a certificate for then. That certificate will allow you to um, gain some continuing education units as well. Like I said, we may or may not touch on every slide, um, but all the slides are, you should take the time and review them when you, when you have a minute, okay? So the day-to-day -day life in a wastewater treatment operator, you know, we monitor equipment. Yeah, I'm living on the DV. Yeah. Perform yeah, some yeah. laboratory analysis. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, we perform some lab analysis, uh, various information we utilize. We do some maintenance and some general written reports and maintaining records. So just this is just a quick little slide. Uh, when you have a minute, take a look at it. It's interesting that once wastewater treatment um, and disinfection were provided, you know, your typhoid rates dropped dramatically. In the early '90s, construction of a wastewater treatment plant. In 2000, I'm not sure if everyone remembers or not, but there was a in Ontario, Canada, in Walkerton, there was a water incident that happened, and that led to the 2002 Safe Drinking Water Act. Unfortunately, we're, we're, it's fortunate and unfortunate that the wastewater treatment is out of sight, out of mind. If it's, everything's running well, nobody hears about us, nobody pays attention to us, it runs fine. As soon as there's an issue, and you know, unfortunately, we, people get sick or we pollute the environment, that's when we wind up uh, getting new regulations put in place and money thrown at the industry. So it's just a slide of interest. That first lesson was just a little general overview. So we're gonna try and focus on the high points. I just wanna talk a minute about the exams when you write them. Spend time on the questions that you know. The, there's, the exams are all time-based. 
there are about 100 questions. Don't spend time on math or other questions that are taking time if you're not sure of the answer. Skip those questions, come back to them. Spend the time, make sure you have enough time to get through the whole exam on the questions that, uh, that, you have, that you're familiar with. You can always go back and tackle those harder questions later. And exams are, are multiple choice. Um, I'm just trying to find my chat function here. Any quick questions uh, on that before we jump into the next section? Okay, I'm not seeing anything come up. So that was just a general overview. We're going to start the next section. We're going to talk a little bit about math. Now, math may or be, I'm just working on sharing my screen. Bear with me for a minute. All right. Okay, so we'll get going. When you write the uh, exam, there's probably five to seven math questions. So again, if, if you're familiar with math, if you like math and you find the questions easy, then, then just go through them and do them. If it's a bit more of a challenge, bypass those questions, come back to them later. Don't, don't waste time on a timed exam. And um, then you'll find yourself with 10 minutes left and you have 30 other multiple choice questions to answer. So tackle the ones that you can. We're going to go through this morning. We're going to take two or three uh, examples of some 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 basic math to go through, and then what I like to do is as we go through the sessions, we'll we'll jump back to the math and keep working through a couple of questions at a time. We're going to focus on typical calculations um, in math. Remember, this is a level one and two course, so should be some basic math, but more of a, hopefully just a refresher for you to uh, walk through. Again, if you have questions at any time, please uh, write them in the chat. I assume that uh, everyone's familiar with the metric system. You may or may not uh, see imperial questions on the exam. So make sure that you uh, have your formula sheets handy, your conversion uh, calculators handy when you write the exam. Be prepared to switch from uh, metric to imperial or imperial to metric. Okay. So rate of flow calculations. Um, if you're testing flow meters, doing some pumping capabilities, wondering how much flow you can put through a tank to receive uh, adequate treatment, uh, rate of flow calculations are, are, are used a lot. We're going to talk about a couple different calculations, one being uh, like a rectangular channel, and, and then we'll, the next one we'll talk about is uh, working through a pipe. So in this Sorry, I just have to move my screen around a little bit. So in this, in this, um, <clears throat> if you're looking at a channel such as this, <clears throat> excuse me, the first thing you want to do is make look at the units that are being used. So in this question, things are a little bit easier. We're at a two meter wide channel. Uh, the depth is half a meter and it's flowing at 0.75 meters per second. So we're in meters. So it's much easier. We don't have to do any calculations. We don't have to do any conversions. We're all in meters per second. So when you look at this question as an example, if this was on the exam, it says, what is the daily flow in the channel if the velocity of the water is 0.75 meters per second? When you write the exam, make sure you read the questions very closely because you're going to do the calculations here in a second on, on that uh, channel. But the end result is it wants, it wants a daily flow. So let's take a look through this calculation. Here. 
So I'm um, hopefully everybody has a pen and paper, maybe a calculator handy. But the water depth, width, depth, and velocity. So if you take two meters, multiplied by 0.5 meters, multiplied by 0.75 meters per second, the answer comes out to 0.75 meter, meters cubed per second. Okay. So that gives you 0.7. 0.75 meter cube per second flow through this channel. But now we've had, but you need to take that and make sure that that meters cube per day. So you, there's a couple different ways to do that, but you can multiply that by 60 seconds in a minute, 24 minutes an hour. And it comes up, you should come up with 64,800 meters cube per day. And that's the answer that they want in a daily flow. Meters cubed is a reasonable answer. Liters per liters is a, a reasonable answer as well. Any questions on, on that one so far? Just looking at the chat function. Okay, I don't see anything popping up there. So in this example, again, the question is, what is the daily flow in a 300 millimeter pipe that's flowing 75% full at a velocity of 40 meters per minute? So in this example, we're dealing with a couple different units. We've got 300 millimeters, a diam diameter of the pipe and meters per minute of flow. So the first thing we need to do is convert this 300 millimeters to meters. So we're dealing in a math calculation, we're dealing with meters on one side and meters on the other side. So 300 millimeters is 0.3 meters. And when we're dealing with round pipes, there's a couple different ways, of calculations I, I realized to do that, but today we're gonna to be dealing with the, uh, uh, the radius of the pipe. Radius is uh, half the diameter, so it's 0.15 meters. Now, a lot of times when you do the exam, you'll have uh, calculation sheets, which are, are very handy to have. Make sure you're familiar with some of the handouts that were provided. <clears throat> They'll be very similar to what you'll see in the exam. And if math is your strong point, these are some um, basic type questions. Uh, so you won't be an issue. If math is not your strong point, you should be able to find the calculation from the sheet and just put the numbers in and be able to come up with an answer. So in this, this formula, it's pi times radius squared times velocity. And always remember that in this question too, the pipe is only 75% full. So if you take that calculation and you put in the numbers, Pipe is 75% uh, full. And you then use the calculation. So it's pi is 3.14 times radius squared, which is 0.15 times 0.15 times the velocity, which is 40 meters a minute. So you wind up with 2.1 meters cubed per minute. I'm just pausing if anybody's taking any notes. So now we have an answer that's in meters cubed per minute, and you need that in uh, some kind of uh, standard flow rate, like we mentioned, that can be meters cubed. Uh, there's a thousand liters in a meter in a cubic meter, or you, it could be converted to liters per second. It depends on what the question asks for. So again, this is just you take your answer meters cubed per minute, and you get that into a, a, a daily flow rate, which is 
which is 3,024 meters cubed per day. Any questions on those? We're only going to do a, a couple more math ones this morning, and then we'll get into something else. I just wanted to get get it started by doing some of those. I'm going to stop my share. I'm trying to access my uh, just the chat function while I'm sharing and I'm having some difficulty doing that. So what I'll do is I'll go back and forth between uh, sharing my screen and then and, and, and uh, not sharing it to check the uh, chat function. Okay. Um, I have one quick question. What time is uh, given to do the exam? Uh, in Canada, they're, they're based on uh, three hour exams. Okay. For uh, level one, two, three, and four. I'm going to go back to, like I said, I'll have to go back and forth of uh, sharing my screen. So bear with me. <clears throat> okay, so there's a, we covered a couple uh, uh, flow rate calculations. Another one that you are going to uh, see is percent calculations. Um, Take a minute when you read these on an exam, make sure you know exactly what they're asking for. So in this situation, a lime solution having a mass of 80 kilograms contains 85% water and the remainder is lime. What's the mass of the lime? So the total, total mass of the solution is 80 kilograms because you got that from a lime solution that has a mass of 80 kilograms which is 100%, that's, that's the whole thing. So if the water rep represents 85%, then the lime represents how much? So if the total mass is 100, mass of water is 85, mass of lime has to be 15%. So now, but they want this answered in, in a kilogram fashion rather than What's in the mass of lime? So, if 85% or 15% wouldn't be a reasonable answer. Got to take that mass of that lime. So, it's 15% of 80 kilograms, which is the 100% solution. So, 12 kilograms is, is lime. Hopefully, that makes sense. Now we're gonna pause on the math section there. Like I said, I just wanted to get a couple of those out of the way to start with this morning. Uh, switch to the next section. We're gonna move on to now, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, safety. Safety, you're probably looking at about 10 questions on your exam. Easy questions usually to answer, especially for the level one and two exam. Something that you uh, want to take some time. And take some time and go through. This is one of the sections that uh, on the exam, you want to make sure that you fully understand safety from this module. And these are, like I said, probably 10 relatively easy questions or marks that you'll be able to get on your exam. So in North America, employers must have a health and safety program. And there is always a joint Health and Safety Committee, which is made up of management and uh, and and uh, staff. Safety is everyone's responsibility, from the operator to the manager to the director. And staff safety is paramount. 
not only for staff, protection of equipment, protection of the environment, it all ties together and safety is a very high priority. So you have employers, uh, sorry, employees have rights. So you have to participate. It's your responsibility to be responsible for yourself. You know, there's a right to know about hazards. There's also the right to refuse work. If uh, you were asked to do something that's unsafe or something that you're unsure of because you haven't been trained, you need to be able to stop that work, make sure you understand what's being asked of you and make sure it's being done safely. As a worker, you need to take responsibility for your own uh, personal health. You need, you need to be responsible for working in compliance with regulations. And again, if you don't know the particular regulation, you need to take a minute and review the documentation, review what's been provided to you, and make sure you understand. Don't put your personal well being in anybody else's hands. Your responsibility is to wear any personal protective equipment that's needed for the job. You also have a responsibility to report uh, things to your employer, your supervisor. Make sure that it's not, you know, don't just see a guard that's missing from a pump and then walk away and let somebody else take care of it. Better report it so it can get fixed. So yourself or nobody else uh, winds up getting hurt. It's also your responsibility to report any known uh, contravention to the acts or regulations. That one's sometimes a little hard, especially if it's a coworker doing something unsafe. But it's very important that at the end of the day, everybody goes home to their to their families. Letting people do things uh, unsafely will sooner or later catch up to them. I've seen. Many, many times where, you know, somebody's been doing the job for 30 years, so they jump down into the hole, they keep, you know, we've done it for 30 years, it's never been a problem. Sooner or later, that will catch up to people and there will be a problem. And, and unfortunately, in our industry, a lot of times that results in, in death. And I don't think uh, anybody wants that for sure. Uh, one of the things too is don't engage in any prank or feats of strength, unnecessary running, roughness, and housing. You know, it's uh, it's not about trying to see how many people, how much you can lift into the back of the truck. You know, I'm quite sure there's a forklift or some kind of lifting device, or get somebody else to give you a hand. Any questions on uh, general safety? I'll just check them. Okay. Okay, don't seeing any, not seeing any questions there. I'm going to talk a little about WIMIS. So Workplace Hazardous Material and Information System. So this is, WIMIS is part of your uh, right to know. So when you're dealing with uh, hazardous chemicals, uh, WIMIS will give you all the information you need to know about that chemical, how to handle it, how to store it, uh, personal protective equipment that needs to uh, be worn, how to deal with spills and cleanups and, uh, and how to deal with any type of exposures. There will be a few questions related to WIMIS uh, on your exams. Um, more what, what WIMIS is, how the system works, it, it won't be pertaining to specific chemicals as an example, but there will be questions on what WIMIS is and how it works. So there's three components to WIMIS. Uh, I'm not sure if you uh, deal with WIMIS very much, but there's labeling, education, and um, MSDS or material safety data sheet. If you're dealing with any chemicals at all and you're unsure, then you want to dig up the, the material safety data sheet, which will give you the information you need, like I said, on how to 
deal with that um, chemical, how to handle it, how to uh, transport it, how to clean it up. Chemical safety. Uh, you will run across a couple of questions on this for sure. So be sure you're uh, clear on the difference between inhalation, absorption, and ingestion. There's, there will probably be a couple of questions on chemical exposures. It's uh, need to be really clear on, on the terms acute exposure and chronic exposure. So acute is uh, something similar. If you're working in a manhole and a gas uh, came down the pipe into the manhole, it'd be a, a short-term exposure of a high level of gas, for example. If you are working in a building, uh, in a centrifuge basement uh, might be more of a chronic exposure. If there's H2S at a low level and you're working in there for an extended period of time. So make sure you understand the difference between acute and chronic. Um, there will also be a couple of questions on um, how you respond if there's a chemical spill or, or if you get splashed with something. Uh, the question might be similar to if you're splashed in the eye with a certain chemical, uh, how long do you have to uh, flush your eyes with? And that, that, that information will be found in the um, MSDS sheet. Personal protective equipment. It's the type of equipment required is based on the, on the job or the chemical that, you, that you're dealing with. So safety goggles, face shields, aprons, uh, it all depends on, on what you're using. I'm not sure if you use any self-contained breathing apparatus or, or SCBAs, but uh, make sure that you're uh, familiar with that. So again, a similar question would be dealing with uh, X chemical and what's the um, personal protective equipment required. So make sure you always revert back to the MSDS sheet. Uh, it's part of the WIMIS system to provide you the information that you need. Any questions on WIMIS? These aren't the most exciting uh, parts of, of, of the course, but they're important because like I said, there's at least 10 questions on your exam that'll be related to safety. And when you're writing the exam, they should be relatively uh, easy questions for you to answer. 10 easy marks. All right. To talk a little bit about elements of fire, obviously, uh, you know, fuel, oxygen, heat are needed. Uh, oxygen, air is about 21% or 20.9% oxygen. And fire only needs 16% to ignite. There might be a point or question, uh, flammable liquids have a flash point below um, 37.8. Celsius and co combustible liquids have a flash point above 37.8. So under the right conditions, you can get fire for sure, you know, but you always need that triangle to be completed. So you need a certain amount of fuel, oxygen, and heat. They will touch on uh, classes of fire. So make sure you're uh, usually a, a, B, and C, so make sure you're familiar with that. Uh, a is uh, materials such as wood, paper, plastics. Uh, B, gasoline, acetone. And C is electrical fires. The reason they have the class of fires is the type of fire extinguisher that would be used. So on an exam, if you were had a an electrical fire, they may ask what type of extinguisher you're going to use. 
So you would use, say, a Class C extinguisher. You would not put a Class A um, extinguisher on electrical fire. Okay, we're going to go into confined spaces a little bit. So definition of a confined space, because of its construction, location, contents, and work activity, limited egress and entry. This is a typical picture of a, a, of a manhole. Uh, I'm a, I would assume that in your jobs, you're dealing with confined spaces. These are even a big, large open tank, a bioreactor or a secondary clarifier. They're all considered confined spaces because of their design. They're not designed for continue, continual occupancy. They're not designed with ladders and stairs so you can enter and exit. Typically, you need to put something into the tank to get it, uh, such as ladder to enter and exit. So by the Canadian Labour Code, confined space is enclosed or partially enclosed space. Large enough for the employee to enter and perform the work, but is not designed for continual occupancy. And one of the questions you're going to see a lot of is has, or one of the terms that will be on the questions is has limited restricted means of entry and exit. Atmospheric hazards, whoops, sorry. Um, mechanical and electro hazards and engulfment hazards. Those are three points of a confined space. So atmospheric hazards, by either what's in the space already or what can potentially enter that space. Mechanical or electrical hazards would be similar to uh, if there's a secondary clarifier, you're, you, the tank was drained and you were working in that tank, well, that mechanism needs to be handled correctly so it doesn't start, that it doesn't move when you're in there. An engulfment hazard would be uh, if the influent gate let go on while well, you're working in that tank and it was flooded and you happen to be uh, find yourself swimming within that tank. A competent person is qualified, knowledgeable, trained, and experienced, and being familiar with the acts. A competent person uh, um, related to the exam when they talk about it is, is been trained, has knowledge of, of acts and regulations, and, and has knowledge of any potential or, or actual danger. So confined space entry needs to uh, be entered and exit um, when everything's safe to do so. Disconnect power at source, lock out piece of equipment. All pipes and, and gates and other water supplies need to be blanked off if possible. If they can't be blanked off, uh, they can be a uh, double block and bleed. The valves can be locked out and isolated. For those, usually you're going to enter with a tripod or some kind of retrieval device as well. For combined space entry, uh, the air needs to be tested. That air testing needs to be recorded. It needs to be a permanent record. If a safety officer comes around, they're going to want to look at that record. Just simply stating, oh, I, I, um, I did, the, did the testing and everything was fine. It's not going, it's not going to fly very well. You have to have everything cert certified in writing. Also, a confined space needs to be free of hazards while people are working in that area. And if there's any change to those hazards, you need to leave that space immediately, deal with the hazards, and then, and then you can continue work. Continuous monitoring, uh, air test units, measuring for gas, 
uh, fumes. Oxygen left than 18% or more than 23. More than likely on the exam, you're gonna see oxygen less than 19.5. 18% is, is a little bit low, but 19.5 would be a trigger limit. Normal oxygen is around 20.9. Excessive oxygen is not necessarily a good thing too. It will cause materials that are normally not likely to burn, that they may quickly uh, ignite and, and burn at higher O2 levels. You will see things on the exam related to gases. For sure, you know many gases uh, cannot be detected by smell. Carbon dioxide, monoxide, hydrogen sulfide at higher concentrations. You need to rely on the air monitoring equipment. That air monitoring equipment needs to be bump tested daily. And what a bump test is, it's uh, the equipment is exposed to a known quantity of gas. Make sure the alarms are working properly, and then it's safe to use for the day. Any questions on uh, on confined space entry, Wemis? Just taking a look in the notes, or Okay, so we're gonna jump into lockout and tagout. There will definitely be questions on the exam about lockout and tagout. Lockout tagout training is mandatory and there also needs to be a policy in place. It's your employer's, employer's responsibility to have that uh, policy, but workers should be very well versed in that policy and hopefully they've had a hand in developing it. So if you're gonna shut down a piece of equipment, <clears throat> you wanna do an order, orderly shutdown. So, and what they refer to as an orderly shutdown is you're working on a pump, you would turn the pump off, then close the isolation valves and drain the pump to work on it, which, which seems, pretty straightforward most of the time, but it needs to be a well thought out procedure. The example of the pump I just gave is pretty basic, but you could have uh, equipment that has multiple sources of power, uh, maybe uh, different uh, multiple valves, things that are, are being dealt with. Uh, so it needs to be well thought out to prevent any danger to staff. When the equipment's locked out, all energy isolation devices uh, need to be isolated. Isolate the machinery or equipment uh, from all energy sources. So when they're talking all energy sources, it's electrical power, maybe it's hydraulic source, let's just water or fluid, and relieving pressure on a pump before you before you open it up. So for lockout and tagout. It needs to be a lock and a tag provided at each point that's being isolated. So in a pump situation, it would be the power for the pump, the isolation valves for the pump. All need a lock and they all need a tag. Each person working on that piece of equipment needs to affix their own lock to the, each and every lockout point. And only that person is allowed to remove those locks. So at the end of the day, if you're leaving, you need to put a hold lock on to bring it to someone's attention that the piece of equipment is, is locked out, but remove your personal safety lock because under a normal day-to-day normal -day job, no one else is allowed to remove your personal safety locks. Stored energy is sometimes uh, something that's not thought about a lot. Uh, you need to be prepared for any uh, stored energy building up behind a valve, for example. Though that stored energy needs to be uh, removed 
before you start working on a piece of equipment. Uh, just a couple more things on lockout and tagout. Uh, verification of isolation. So if you're going to go work on a pump, you need, to, like I said, you need to apply your own locks to each and every lockout point. You need to make sure that that pump is isolated correctly or that tank is isolated correctly before you start work on it. Safety is your responsibility uh, as well as other workers, but you do not want to put your own health and safety in other people's hands. And release from lockout and tagout. Uh, releasing is, is the almost a, a direct reverse order of when you took that piece of equipment out. So the items that you locked out you, you, and your process for taking that piece of equipment out of service, you would then reverse direction, uh, take those locks out, take those tags out and return that piece of equipment to service. I mentioned that you're not permitted to remove others locks. There has to be a lock removal procedure put in place for that, which requires uh, trying to contact a person that's not at work, trying to uh, uh, contact the safety department, uh, usually results in uh, cutting personal safety locks off. So there's a lot of paperwork that has to be done on that. So again, at the end of the day, when you leave, put a hold lock in place, and so other people can uh, then work on that piece of equipment or return it to service if, if they need to be, if you happen to be going on some days off. Okay, just uh, pause for a second, see if there's any questions on lockout and tagout. I don't see any. So those were uh, a couple sections that are a, a little drier as part of the course, and I understand that, but they're very important. They're also relatively easy ex answers on, ex on an exam, like I said, and there will be questions related to those. So we're gonna jump to, there we go. I'll just have to share my screen again. We're going to jump to applied sciences. We're probably going to take uh, in about 15 minutes, we'll probably take a quick stretch break so everybody can uh, refill their coffee or have a quick five, five, ten, or about a five minute stretch break. Okay. So, what are applied sciences? We're going to talk about waterborne microorganisms. It's a little more, little more interesting than, than safety for sure, but safety is a, a very important part of your job. Bacteria. We're going to, we're going to touch on different types of bacteria, uh, what they look like, what they eat, where they might, where they might survive, um, things that are important uh, understanding. Uh, there's also, depending on your type of treatment, bacteria are used to, uh, different forms of bacteria are used to, to perform different functions of wastewater plant. Bacteria are also pretty, pretty healthy. They, they can live in high, high temperatures, low temperatures, and they eat everything from sugars and starches. Uh, some live on sunlight. Some even eat sulfur and iron. So thousands of species of bacteria, uh, some are rod shaped, stick shaped, others are shaped like balls <clears throat> and some are even uh, spherical in, in shape. It's, it's important to have an understanding of what bacteria are, possibly shapes that they are, not so much the individual types of bacteria, those would be something that would be considered my either uh, level three or four course or possibly in a, in a lab course. So bacteria are found in just about everywhere. <laughs> um, 
your skin averages about 100,000 bacteria in, in, a square centimeter, in a square centimeter of your skin. So they're everywhere. They're, they can be dormant. They almost, you know, will be sitting on a door handle, pretty much inactive, doing nothing until they come in contact with your hand. And then once they have a host to live on or breed off of, then they can grow and you know, from that point in time. So bacteria move around in, in different forms. Uh, as in this picture here, they, 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 these little flagellants at the end, you know, this bacteria, that's how he propels himself around. Kind of like a little outboard motor moving through liquid. And they have one single mission in life, and that's just to live and procreate to make more bacteria. So some bacteria are photosynthetic, which means they can make their own food from sunlight, just like plants do, plants in your garden. Uh, also like plants, these would give off oxygen. And other bacteria absorb food or material they live in or on. So in a wastewater uh, treatment facility, that's fantastic because we're trying to grow bacteria that live off the wastewater. And, and consume the, the components of that wastewater to help us in order to clean it. You're gonna to touch on, or you're gonna hear uh, about E. coli for sure. You know, E. coli is, is common. You, you have e, e. coli in your system. Um, and they, all, they also make certain body, vitamins that your body needs. Where you do not want to see is, is millions of E. coli leaving your treatment facility and entering into a water stream somewhere. Usually the E. coli are tested at, uh, at, the, at the effluent of each facility. Um, many of those results need to be report, reported to some industry or, or uh, um, provincial body to make sure that you're meeting your requirements. Talk about viruses for a minute. Viruses are one of those things that, you know, they straddle the face or fence between living and non-living. Uh, they're floating around or sitting on a doorknob and they're, and they're doing nothing. They're, you know, some people refer to them, they're just sitting there like a rock until they come into contact with skin or, or somebody is, it, it touches that. And as soon as they do, they spring into life and they start living and, and they will live off the body or the host. Okay. There's a slide on what viruses look like. I doubt that you're gonna see much of that, um, what viruses look like in your, in your exams. They will, on your exam, you will touch into where viruses are found. It's found just about everywhere. Um, and make sure that you understand that there's different viruses that uh, infect animal cells, for example, through uh, plants. Okay. Um, so single-minded mission. Like I said, they just want to live and they want to reproduce. That's what they do. Day in, day out, they have no other mission in life. Bear with me for one second. I'm going to touch on protozoa a little bit. So the word protozoa means little animal. Uh, protozoa, you're gonna see a lot in wastewater treatment plants. If you look at the uh, microscope under a uh, mixed liquor uh, sample, you're gonna see a lot of protozoa, uh, different stages, different uh, life cycle. Um, and there, again, their mission is they run around, they're trying to hunt and gather food.
protozoa feed on bacteria, but they also eat other protozoa. And they also eat bits of things that uh, other, other organisms leave behind. It'll be important to, uh, for your exam to, when people are talking about the sizes of, of organisms or filtration and stuff is, is, is what a micron is. So take a minute when you have time, look at this slide and understand how big a micron is. You might get a filter that's a 10 micron filter. So what exactly does that mean? All right, so public health and microbiology. Microorganisms are small uh, uh, organisms. They're living. They can be pathogens. They can be non-pathogenic. So non-pathogenic uh, are, are beneficial. Like if, you make, uh, if you make beer or cheese or have digestion, those are non-pathogenics. Pathogenics are ones that cause human uh, diseases in humans. The reproductive rate is basically doubled at all times. So you'll start with one that's then split, and now you have two, and then to four, eight, and 16. Bacteria can come from uh, poor sewage treatment, uh, septic farm, septic uh, fields, farm runoff, uh, disinfection chlorine, UV, and ozone to uh, uh, treat those bacteria or disinfect them. We will talk a little when in, the, in future sections, we'll talk about chlorine, uh, UV, and, and how, that, how, they, uh, how they actually disinfect. But this is just a high level review of it right now. Okay. Uh, wastewater biology organisms uh, in a treatment facility. In order for it to function well, you need energy, carbon sources, nutrients, oxygen. Uh, some of these bacteria break break down these components. They produce methane gas, like in a in a digester. Maybe carbon dioxide, uh, nitrates, and phosphates. Some treatment plants are are designed to specifically treat for nit uh, remove uh, ammonia and phosphates. And some are just, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, some, and then some just to basic activated sludge plants that break down what's in the wastewater, but they do not go to the next step for uh, removal of ammonia, nitrates and phosphates. Sewage so discharges. Um, some of the things that uh, are gonna be required to be monitored by uh, uh, provincial regulations, you know, solids, nitrogen, phosphorus, maybe metals uh, required, uh, metal testing and, and bacteria results. So we're about an hour, just bear with me two seconds. We're about an hour in right now. I just want to give everybody a quick minute to, if there's any questions. And also I'd like to take uh, about, maybe about three minutes. Um, just if you need a quick bio break, grab a drink of water or something, and then we'll, we'll carry on. Okay, that sounds okay, Mike. Um, so let's take a, I'll just pause for now for us to take a quick five minute Maybe break. Five, five minutes, yeah. Okay, okay five minute break. Great, okay. thank you. All right, thank you, Mike. Back. So we're covering a lot of information in these sessions. Uh, there was a question about the slides and, and uh, that link was posted. You'll see it in the chat there uh, where you can access the slides. Definitely have handy to have a printout of these slides in, in advance of, of each session for sure. Uh, it helps go through, it helps you take some notes. Um, these sessions are much easier in face-to-face uh, -face where you can ask questions a little more freely. Uh, when you're explaining something, you can see the look on people's faces maybe that uh, there may or may not be some understanding. 
So definitely ask, ask questions uh, as we go along. We're covering a lot of information in a short period of time, trying to give you what you need to pass your exams. Um, and if you're unsure of something that I, I need to know so I can spend more time on that section or review it a little more. Okay. All right. I'll go back to sharing my screen. So nutrient impacts. Uh, the reason a wastewater treatment facility exists is to protect public health and the environment. If you don't have a treatment plan in place, in place, you wind up with situations like this picture. You have excess nutrients going to the environment, which can cause uh, eutrophication and 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 dramatically impact a water source. Okay. Eutrophication is, is a high impact of nutrients, which can result in algae blooms. That's one, one thing that you may want to write down because I can almost guarantee you it'll be on, eutrophication will be on, on the exam for sure. So a little bit about wastewater chemistry. So you deal, you deal with different states of matter, solids, liquids, and gas. Okay. Solid obviously holds its shape. A liquid um, follows the shape of the container or, 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 or cylinder that it happens to be in. And, and gas will, will shape to the container and usually fill up the whole volume of that container as well. I don't think you're gonna see it on the exam, but it is uh, important to understand that protons, neutrons, and electrons are the building blocks for, uh, for, all, for all living matter or for all matter. And an example of that would be a hydrogen atom uh, and an oxygen atom. So compounds are, are made up of a combination of elements. You know, if you're dealing with uh, sodium chloride, uh, hydrogen sulfides, the compound uh, of water, for example, H2O, two atoms of, of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. So if you break it down, that's what that looks like. So hydrogen. Hydrogen sulfide, H2S, would be the same calculation of two atoms of, of hydrogen and one of sulfide. You won't get much into molecular weights on a level one or two exam, but it is important to understand that H2O, what that means, H2S, what that means, the atoms, by weight. Organic compounds um, always contain carbon. They usually have uh, hydrogen and oxygen. And inorganics have no carbon. Inorganic compounds don't break down. Not, not in, you know, inorganics might be sand, gravel, that type of thing. Organic compounds are basically anything that uh, has some carbon source that's living that can be broken down to a different form. pH con concentrations. There will be uh, definitely some questions on pH. The easiest way to review pH is, you know, think of it on, on a scale. So a pH of seven is neutral. As the pH goes up, it's acidic. As the pH goes down, it's basic. 
Just checking the chat. Okay. Okay, it's good. Um, typically in wastewater, pHs will be around 6.5 to 7 on, on, incoming, on incoming sewage. It's important to monitor that pH on a daily basis. Most facilities have some kind of online monitoring. The reason you need to monitor that is a change in pH, a dramatic change of pH will directly affect the organisms in the wastewater treatment facility. Um, if someone dumps something in the sewer that can, a large quantity can dramatically impact your plant or potentially even kill the microorganisms that are there. Better off to monitor the influence sewage for pH and so you can potentially deal with it Hopefully you can divert some of the flow. Uh, maybe you can isolate one or two of your biological tanks. Uh, um, even if you had a, uh, uh, some kind of pH enter the, that killed your part, a portion of your plant, better to isolate a couple tanks, potentially kill the other ones, but be able to reseed those from the tanks that you isolated and in, in, that you saved from uh, being affected. Talk a little bit about filtration, uh, sand filtration. I'm not sure if you have uh, filters at, at your facilities or not, uh, but there will be questions on, on filtration, uh, whether it be sand filters or disc filters, they all work on the basic con same kind of concept. And uh, sand filtration, for example, you have an inlet pipe here by gravity, then the water goes through the sand, through the gravel, and out through an outlet pipe. Usually, uh, filters require some kind of backwashing to, uh, you would isolate the filter. You fluidize the bed, which means you'd inject water back into this bed, bring everything into uh, a fluid state, and then have a withdrawal system to take off any solids that were trapped in the sand. Typically, those solids are then uh, sent to a uh, clean is sent to a landfill or potentially put back to uh, So I was waiting for the recording to start again. So when the coagulants are added, uh, basically what they're to do is take uh, smaller portions and make larger portions, which are then easy to precipitate out, to settle out, to treat. Um, alum uh, might be used in a treatment plant, polymers for dewatering. Solids on smaller pieces. Nitrogen is, you know, uh, it's essential for growth in, in plants and animals. It's, um, I find it in a wastewater treatment plant uh, at, uh, at the end of the system. Some higher level plants actually target removing nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay. And nitrogen can cause eutrophication, which we talked about before. So make note of that as well. Okay, so basically it's like putting nitrogen uh, pellets if you have money, you're raising it. Uh, people put fertilizer on the lawn to make things grow. Well, nitrogen in a wastewater effluent stream does the exact same thing. And enough, isogen, enough nitrogen will cause excessive uh, growth of algae in lakes and streams. So, uh, you know, these things are all needed in a normal uh, um, infant. Where we run into problems when there's excessive phosphorus or excessive nitrogen leads to a body of water. These are some of the examples we showed this 
picture or picture of algae blooms when you have excessive amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, in a water source. They then promote the growth uh, of algae and, and other issues. Sedimentations, I'm not sure if uh, you do much lab work in, in your facilities, but you should be familiar with um, sedimentation and how it works. Uh, different, different tanks in a, in a treatment facility, such as primary clarifiers, uh, where you actually want settling, uh, you take the sludge off the bottom of the tanks. Secondary clarifiers, uh, you want to promote settling there as well. Uh, to let the solids of the sludge settle up to turn them to uh, either a bioreactor or a, or a mixed liquor tank. Does that uh, do we do jobs? To, I'm just gonna ask a question here. Do you lab work? Do uh, the types of uh, uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, settling, uh, do you have to deal with that on a regular basis? Okay. Not a couple answers there uh, that it's not dealt with normally. It's, it's good for me to know because I, I it helps me formulate uh, how much time we're going to spend on some of these um, some of these some of these uh, questions tests. Setability tests uh, three days a week. Okay, good. And a few no's. <clears throat> So our, our industry is, is very unique in certain ways because um, <clears throat> your uh, wastewater level water two certificate allows you to work at any uh, wastewater facility. So it may or may not be the things that you're dealing with that are in these exams, but there has to be a general understanding of, of, the, of the knowledge. So uh, dissolved oxygen. Uh, if you have uh, some type of biological reactor, a mixed liquor tank, you will be putting uh, dissolved oxygen in there at, at some point in time. Even lagoons have uh, may have aerators or they might um, rely on their own oxygen generation. Uh, DO or dissolved oxygen is temper, temp, temperature related. It's necessary for life. Uh, the organisms that are living in the wastewater need dissolved oxygen. So we've created bacteria, created protozoa. They're living in your reactors. They have food from the wastewater, but now they need dissolved oxygen to live. Okay. <clears throat> it's important to note that cold water holds more oxygen than warm water. This is one terminology that you need to be very familiar with, biochemical oxygen demand, or BOD. It's a test used to measure the concentration of biodegradable organic matter present in a sample of water. So what that basically means is whatever's contained in that sample of water, how much oxygen is required to break down that material. And that's a BOD is a five day test. Uh, you take a sample, you prepare the sample, you put it in, a, in an incubator for five days. And then when you take it out, you, you re read the uh, oxygen level and it'll tell you how much oxygen change there's been and what it, take, what it took to break down that sample. This is an important one. Make sure you uh, commit that, uh, if you're not familiar with it, make you, sure you commit that to memory of, of what a BOD test is. You're also going to see questions about solids. So you've got floatable solids, suspended solids, uh, settable solids. Um, inorganics, organics, they're all mixed together. Uh, so floatable solids would be like scum. 
uh, from a primary clarifier. Suspended solids would be mixed liquor, maybe from a bioreactor or a mixed liquor tank. And settable solids would be sludge. So from primary clarifier, secondary clarifier. We'll talk a little bit about uh, disinfection. And again, I know I fully realize that we're covering a lot of information in a short period of time. Uh, definitely, I encourage you to ask questions now or send questions later. Either way, we'll get the answer for you. I just want—I just wanted to make note too that uh, as we go through these courses, I have several uh, uh, exams um, that have uh, multiple questions. Uh, Not—they're not written for the exam you're going to write, but they're very similar. Some of the things you might, that you might encounter. They're also very handy to uh, prep you for exam. Uh, if you haven't written an exam in a long period of time, it, it preps you for uh, getting used to that situation, being able to write that exam. And I think when I share those out, I think what we'll do is uh, we'll um, have you do the exams on your own. And then we'll go through the answer, take, take a half hour, go through the answers and explain anything that pops up. Uh, the nice thing about those exams is you only need to focus on the questions that, that you were not successful on. Um, if, you, if you know you got 80% of those exams or those questions right, then there's not much time or there's no sense you spending a lot of time reviewing that. Uh, focus on the 20 that you needed some help on. So disinfection. You want to inactivate or destroy pathogen pathogens. So inactivation might be from UV treatment. Uh, destroying would be with uh, chlorine treatment or um, some sort of other uh, chlorine gas or calcium hypochlorite. UV treatment inactivates uh, bacteria by uh, entering the cell membrane of the bacteria. It deactivates them so it doesn't allow them to reproduce. Uh, the bacteria are still living when they go out of the plant and into the water source, but they have a very short life cycle. They can't reproduce and they die off. Chlorine is uh, destroying which means it instantly kills everything that's in the wastewater. So if you have a chlorine residual, which means uh, an amount of chlorine at the end of at the end of at the end of your test, then you know that everything contained in that sample or in your wastewater flow has been uh, has been destroyed. Going to move to a couple different slides. So this just uh, uh, oxidization. It uh, just a graphical representation of, of what's happening. If you're applying applying. Uh, Chlorine, for example, instantly kills that, that bug. If you're starving, if starvation, you have a bug that's floating around, it's trying to live off digestive uh, enzymes. You got some food that's trying to get in there and, and the chlorine basically kills everything around that bug and then eventually the bug dies off. Where, where chlorination is, um, is used, you, you're also going to probably need some kind of dechlorination. Uh, chlorine is very effective for treating wastewater and killing what's in there. But if you have a residual chlorine, that residual is then going to go to the water source and kill what's ever in the water source. So most chlorine applications require uh, dechlorination which is done by addition of uh, uh, chemicals to uh, then remove the chlorine or at least reduce the chlorine to a, a reasonable, reasonable amount. 
Okay. Any questions on, uh, any questions on, on um, applied sciences? I do from the comments I see that uh, you know some of the slides weren't weren't available before the course, so definitely take some time review the the first uh, five or six um, powerpoints, and when we get together next week, we can we can review anything that you need to review. All right, so I'm going to bring up the next section. We're going to talk a little bit about pipes and valves. Definitely, you're going to see questions on uh, on pipes and valves. You're going to need a, uh, an understanding of that. Uh, just give me a second while I get the PowerPoint fired up. Uh, yes, uh, there was a question, but we'll be covered pumps. We'll be talking about pumps as well. Uh, not sure if we'll get into it uh, today, but uh, it'll either be at the end of today's session or uh, the beginning of the first session, we'll be talking about uh, pumps for sure. Level one uh, and two operators. There will be many questions on exams related to uh, valves, pipes and pumps. What, what type of equipment is used in certain locations? Uh, what's the best thing to, to be used. So we will definitely cover that. So there's a lot of different pipe out there, you know, for sure, uh, asbestos pipe, PVC pipe, ductile iron. Um, we're going to touch on each one briefly. It's a good understanding to know that there are different types of pipe. Uh, pipe selection is basically designed on maximum pressure. What that pipe is able to withstand, depending on that, which depends on where you're putting that pipe, whether it's uh, on the discharge of a positive displacement pump that has a high that has a high pressure. Uh, asbestos cement pipe. There's always a safety concern. We don't see a lot of that anymore because people are dealing with asbestos. Ductile iron pipe, just black iron pipe. You're going to see a lot of that. It's going to, it'll, it can handle a really high pressure. Uh, usually bolted flanges are how it's put together. Uh, easy to work on as far as uh, taking the flanges off and cleaning pipes or replacing, replacing pipe sections. Definitely heavier to work with, uh, depending on the uh, length of pipe. Concrete pipe, uh, mainly used in sewer systems, um, potentially inside a facility uh, from one from one uh, treatment process to the other, but uh, a lot of times it's used out in the sewer system. Steel pipe, uh, welded pipe can withstand any most most pressures for sure. Uh, not typically used a lot in, in, uh, in, a, in a plant, uh, can be used in sewer systems for sure. Uh, ductile iron is used a lot, a lot more in the plant. What you're seeing a lot of now is a PVC pipe because uh, most, most pressures, it, depending on the uh, type of PVC, it, it can handle a max pressure of 1400 kPa, so it's used a lot. Nice thing about uh, PVC, it's easy to fix, it's easier to replace. Um, you know, an operator, if there was something happened on in the middle of the night or on a weekend, an operator could fix a PVC pipe themselves rather than having to uh, deal with mechanical staff. And definitely, uh, there's a big one, the cost is about 30% less than, sorry, 30% less than uh, steel. Um, that's changed a bit over time. I know that uh, PVC is not as cheap as it used to be, but it's it's usually uh, cheaper than the metal pipe. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about valves. The right valve, the right selection of valve for the uh, 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 application is important. 
So we got check valves. So if you're familiar with these, um, uh, they are to prevent flow in one direction only. So what happens is flow comes through, pushes this seat open and allows flow to flow through the pipe. If there was any backwards flow, the seat drops down, seals across here and prevents the flow through. We got a couple of questions hanging on a second. Okay, I had a couple of questions. I'm gonna pause there, uh, uh, just reading the questions. I'd like you to, uh, to explain briefly the factors to consider when designing a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, really good question. It's uh, not one that could be uh, answered easily. I would like to maybe push that to uh, the beginning of the next section because the mitigant, beginning of the next course, because there's uh, quite a few uh, components that are uh, some that can be used and the factors for that. So I'll, I'll finish the session today and I'll bring that up uh, next time. I'm just going to uh, make a note so I can make sure I'm prepared to answer that. Uh, now the question is, uh, we'll be covering the schedules of, uh, of piping. So piping schedules and, and their design. Um, we will touch on it briefly, but it's not a major component uh, of, of the, your exams that you're going to run across. Um, another question is, what happened to HDP uh, pipe? Um, HDP pipe is, is definitely used. Uh, it's not due to the way that pipe is, has to be joined together. It's not used a lot. Um, you, I doubt that you're gonna see a question on HTTP on, on your exam either. Okay, uh, gate valves. So this typical gate valve is the handle that you would use. When you uh, turn this handle, you're, you're taking the seat of this valve, lifting it up, which allows flow through the valve. Gate valves are designed to be operated in 100% uh, open or 100% closed. Now, when I say design, that's typically not how they're used. They're used in a lot of places as a control valve. Problem with using them as a, a control valve, you get a lot of, you, you can get a lot of wear and tear on the bottom of the seat, depending on what's going through. So. If you're using a gate valve for control on a mixed liquor tank, it's mainly liquid or uh, a microscopic solid. So as a control valve, it works just fine. Uh, if you were using that as a control valve for a grit tank, you're gonna have sand and gravel wearing away at the bottom of the seat. And when you go to close this, eventually when you go to close this valve, it's not gonna seat properly. So just remember uh, different types of valves. So we talked about check valves, gate valves, maybe some of their applications. Uh, butterfly valves, uh, you're gonna see a lot of those uh, used as control valves. Excuse me. Uh, you'll, use, you'll see a lot of them used on, on, on air tanks, salt oxygen, uh, control uh, to use for control there. They, and the interesting thing about a, uh, the butterfly valve is after you reach a certain percentage, it's not controlling anymore. So if you can imagine air flowing through this valve, as soon as you open it up uh, 30 to 50%, anything above that, you don't have very much control over. Okay. So you have really fine, good control at the lower end, but not so much on the higher end. Globe valves. So these, you're gonna see a lot of globe valves for sure. Again, these have a handle crank potentially on top or some kind of uh, actuator. Um, flow goes through the pump. 
when you open the seat by turning the valve, flow goes up and then through the valve. You'll see a lot of these in uh, uh, altitude tanks, uh, flow and pressure control. Okay. They're really dependable more because of the seat design, even the wear and tear on them, uh, even when they wear down a bit, if you turn the handle a little bit harder, uh, chances are that that valve's going to seat. Plug valves, uh, uh, and sorry, plug and ball valves. So if you're looking at, I just have to move my screen around, there we go. So you're looking at this ball valve, you can see a lot of those uh, ball valves are used on chemical tanks, uh, that type of thing. And basically you turn the handle and this uh, ball when open allows flow to go through. When it's closed, this is would be at a, at a, a 90 degrees which then this side of the valve is facing the uh, water or chemical stream, not allowing any flow through. Uh, they work well. The cost uh, can be a little expensive depending on, on the type that's used. Okay. And not so good for control either. Not, you're not to be used so much as a control valve. You may see uh, some altitude valves or, or pressure relief valves. Most of those you're going to see in a, more of a water system than a wastewater system. But just to touch base on them so you can have some understanding. Uh, uh, air vacuum relief valves, pressure relief valves, you're going to see these. These are very, these are similar to exactly what you have on your hot water tank at home. And basically, uh, as the pressure increases, this, this uh, handle would flip and it's going to blow off any high pressure that happens to be there. Okay. Altitude valves, uh, mainly in a water system, but I just wanted to mention it briefly. Uh, if you may be controlling levels in a tank or a reservoir, uh, that type of thing. Now, most, it's unfortunate, but most, uh, most valves are, are, are left in place. They're only operated when needed. And what can happen is when you need to operate a valve, it doesn't work. So valve maintenance programs, valve exercise programs are, are, are very crucial to a, a plant. Um, it does take some time to run around and open and close each valve, uh, at least maybe even on an annual basis but uh, it is important. When you need that valve and it doesn't work, then you're dealing with other problems. Um, you may need to, depending on the type of valve, you might need to uh, make some adjustments, lubricate that valve. Like I said, trying to exercise at least once, once per year is, is, is better uh, than not doing it at all. One thing that's important too is uh, some of the larger valves, like maybe on an influent to your uh, uh, facility, if you're exercising those valves or those gates, it's to record the number of turns on that valve. Uh, we have many large valves that are required an X number of turns and, and sometimes uh, uh, parts of that or components of that valve or gate might get broken and people are standing there for an hour turning this valve and it's having no effect. And that's because down below something is broken. So if it's a if it's a hundred turn valve and you, and you track that and you're at 125, you know that something's broken right away. So keep track of that. And that's why you would use the number of turns. Cross connection, you're definitely going to see some questions about that. Uh, cross connection is a connection of a, a contaminated water to a potable water source. Um, backflow is uh, backflow preventers are used for that. Um, backflow devices, uh, check valves, air gaps. You're going to hear a lot about air gaps. Air gap is basically if if you had a uh, uh, water flow into a tank 
and you could act, and you could see that water flowing and then dropping into the tank, that would be considered an air gap. So the only way that that water could be potable water could be can come contaminated is if the level in the tank rose high enough to touch the bottom of that pipe. So an air gap is an actual physical separation uh, between between a contaminated source and potable water. Uh, here's a uh, backflow preventer device installed. You'll notice that there's uh, valves on each side, so you can take these devices out and 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 service them, check them when needy. Um, a lot of chemical systems might have a, a more of a, a check valve situation to allow flow uh, not to go in a certain direction. Uh, many times they'll they'll install uh, dual check valves uh, just a little little ways apart, so you're doubling your uh, protection there. I'm going to pause and check any questions. Any questions on valves, potentially where they would be used? At the beginning of our next session, too, I'm going to be uh, asking for a little more involvement. And I'm going to be asking some questions related to uh, some of the stuff we're covering today. Uh, so I said, take some time, review the material. If you have any questions, make sure you have them ready for next time. Um, also, be prepared to answer a couple of questions for me in advance of, of some of the things we covered. We're going to move on to pumps uh, uh, for the next section. And the pumps will be the last section for today. Is there any questions on valves before we go move, move forward? See any? Just get the PowerPoint ready. Okay. So the last section for today, we're going to talk about pumps. Now uh, we might finish a little before. Uh, 7.30 my time, so it's 10.30 uh, your time. We might finish a little bit early today, but that's fine. We want to make sure we have time to answer any questions and, and go through. We're going to talk about uh, different types of pump. A lot of them that you're going to deal with in a wastewater facility are uh, positive displacement pumps or cent centrifugal pumps. The component, the components of those pumps. Uh, okay, I had a just a question on valves. I'd like to pause and answer that. Question is, what type of valves are used for isolation in pipelines from from lift stations to a treatment facility? Yeah, generally speaking, uh, uh, we use mainly gate valves. Gate valves are easy to close, and when they're uh, uh, locked out, they're they're easy to to identify that they're locked and they seldom, once the seat is, it has been seated, it, it very, unless the seat's gone, it's not gonna leak, it'll handle any back pressure. And so we use uh, gate valves for that. Uh, what's the most common valve used in wastewater? It, that, that really depends on the application. Um, you know, we in our facilities we have on our all our dissolved oxygen control. It, they're all uh, butterfly valves, and then uh, large isolation valves are, are usually gate valves. We use a lot of ball valves on chemicals. Um, they stand up the ball valves and design. Although they're expensive, they stand up to chemicals, which make it a lot easier uh, longevity. Another question is which valve is better for wastewater swing? swing, uh, spring or, or ball valves. That all depends on the application. Um, there isn't one valve that'll do everything. Um, it depends on the application. Most of the time, um, when you put in a system, some engineering firm or your city engineer will help you uh, uh, do valve selection. 
Um, but I wouldn't say there's one that's better in a wastewater facility as much as the right valve for the right application is more important. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. So let's talk about centrifugal pumps. These are the most common pumps you're gonna find in your plant. Uh, they're, they're great for almost any application. Um, they can be used to pump chemicals. They can use to pump uh, water, wastewater. Um, they can be used almost anywhere. They're not um, without a lot of uh, extra controls. They're not the best for specific control, but we'll talk about different kind of pumps for that, but they definitely um, are used throughout the plant. Many, many occasions. We need to break down the, the centrifugal pump a little bit because these questions will appear on your, on your exam. So I'm gonna take a couple minutes and step through this. So if this was a typical pump, flow comes into the pump, this spins, and as it spins, the water's picked up in this section and then discharged out the top. We will talk a little bit about uh, different types of uh, centrifugal pumps and the impellers. There's, there's closed impellers, open impellers, and those are all basically des uh, designs that are for specific applications. If you were pumping a lot of solids, you wouldn't use a closed impeller like this because the flow has to be entered between these two plates and then spun around. You'd use an open type impeller, which just had some kind of similar veins, which would then just push more volume through, including the solids. It's important to know about the stuffing box, which is at this end of the pump, uh, packing. So the stuffing box, contains the packing. Okay. So the shaft runs through, connects to the impeller. You have packing, and then packing is contained within the stuffing box. And I'm, when I spend, when I spend some time uh, talking about a specific item, it's, it's for your general understanding for sure, but chances are you're going to see questions related to items that I'm spending more time on. So packing is important. Uh, it causes, it's the seal in this pump. So it allows the water, or it does not allow the water just to flow from one way and strictly out and down the shaft. You're gonna want to adjust your packing. So you have a few drops per second of water and that way you know everything's clear, it's sealing and it's cooling this shaft because the shaft's spinning inside the packing, which is inside the stuffing box. Uh, the eye of the impeller, you might hear about that. The eye of the impeller is the center of the impeller, whether it's a closed face impeller, an open face, it, the center of the impeller is the eye. Okay. Uh, you're gonna see uh, uh, wear rings on pumps and they're exactly used for exactly what they're, uh, they're, they're, the name is for. So that wear ring is a sacrificial part. As this pump is spinning, the impeller spinning, um, the shaft supported by the packing somewhat and allowing flow to cool, the, to cool that shaft. On the other end, there's a wear ring that this pump is, is, is going around. Now the wear ring, when they wear, wear out, it's gonna allow flow past them for sure. So you'll, you'll know there's a problem there. But this wear ring is designed to be removed and replaced. And it's the sacrificial part so you don't have to replace impellers all the time. When you do service, you may just have to re replace the uh, wear ring. Again, when you, when you get the slides, pay attention to this, uh, these ones that explain what I just talked about, stuffing box, packing, shafts, sleeves. Positive displacement pumps are used uh, in many locations, whether they're feeding pressurized tanks or they're 
a quantity of flow. A lot of chemical systems will use a positive displacement pump because you every time that pump moves or, or uh, has a pump stroke, it's moving a certain volume of water or chemical. It's very easy for control. Positive dis displacement pumps include gear pumps, diaphragm pumps, screw pumps, piston pumps. Just uh, just checking if I had a had a uh, picture of a of a positive displacement pump. Um, talk about the diaphragm pump for a minute. So this is a positive displacement pump. Um, diaphragm pumps have a lot of times have been replaced by screw pumps with a rotor and a stator. As the rotor and stator turn, the cavities allow a certain volume of water chemical through, and that's how it's metered. Same concept with a diaphragm pump. So here's a diaphragm on the pump. This diaphragm moves back and forth. When it retracts, it allows a certain, certain volume to fill this cavity. When it moves forward, it pushes that volume up the top, closes off the suction. So you're getting a certain volume of chemical or water. The biggest thing about diaphragm or uh, positive displacement pumps is they're really good for control. You only have so much flow per stroke or rotation of that pump. Positive displacement pumps definitely cause some uh, uh, pressure on the discharge side. Okay. Um, positive displacement pumps can also create a suction lift. So what a suction lift is, it's, be, it's able to lift chemical because it's a closed system. It's able to lift chemical from the pump maybe above the uh, chemical tank and it's able to lift that pump out of the, or the chemical out of the tank into the pump and push it forward. Uh, centrifugal pump, typically the pumps are below the water level or the tank level they're using because they're not self-priming. I had a question, hang on. Uh, the question is, is the globe valve the only one with packing? Uh, typically, you're not going to see any other valves with packing so much, but definitely I'd concentrate more on packing questions related, related to pumping. Hopefully that answers the question. So just want to talk on applications of pumps for a minute. So submersible pumps, turbine pumps, uh, great for well pumping systems, maybe uh, uh, C2 water usage around the plant. Uh, jet pumps, they, you're not going to see a lot of questions on jet pumps for sure. Um, you might, you're definitely going to see questions on centrifugal pumps, understanding those pumps, how they how they work, uh, sources that they they are typically below the tanks. Um, I will get into pumping curves and stuff a little bit later on in the sessions, which will explain a little more about uh, uh, centrifugal pumps and and their uh, operation. So packing glands. So like we mentioned it, or I mentioned when the, uh, during that diagram, there will be questions on packing glands for sure. Uh, prevent, uh, it's a seal around the shaft, so it prevents leakage of water from just flowing out of the pump. It also prevents air from entering the pump. You wanna have, uh, depending on, on the required manufacturer spec, but you wanna have some leakage from that packing. So it provides cooling, cooling and lubrication for the shaft. So 
I'm going to see if I can zoom this up a little bit. Hopefully that's zoomed on your screen a little bit. So centrifugal pump. Here's the packing around the shaft. It may have a flush port. And it's going to have a, a, a lantern ring. And again, this all, all contained within the stuffing box. So the lantern ring allows for uh, an area to be flushed. There will be questions about lantern rings on your, on your exams for sure. So this packing is cut in, in, in strips and then put around the shaft. You would put one piece of packing in at a time, then your lantern rings, and then some more packing. These are the packing glands and adjustment nuts. These be adjusted the exact same amount every time there's a change. And the change would be uh, allow whatever the manufacturer is on the spot uh, uh, for leakage past. So if this packing was replaced, so if you can imagine uh, you had a pump, you had a pump and service at packing and over, over time you gen, uh, adjusted the uh, gland because it was leaking a little more. So you adjust the gland and then months go by, you maybe adjust again. So when you go to replace that packing, it started at, we'll just say that thick. And by the time you're done, it's down to that thick. So you take this pump out of service, you pull off the glands, you take all the packing out, you put in new packing, you put it in there snugly, but not too firm. And you put the, everything back together and you start up that piece of equipment. Now you're obviously gonna have more leakage than would be normal. And then you would slowly adjust these, adjust the glands evenly to compress this packing. It's very, very important to only make small adjustments and then come back after a certain period of time and take a look at it. You need to go back, then you would adjust it again. If you replace that packing and put the gland and the nuts back to where they were when you took it out of service, you would have compressed this new packing and to a point where you would have no leakage whatsoever. If there's no leakage, there's no lubrication on the shaft, there's no cooling, and you will cause a failure in this pump. So when you put it in, allow for some leakage, come back and check it, do some adjustments, and you may have to do that two or three or four times until you get to a point where you uh, have the leakage needed. This leakage should be expected uh, uh, depending on your pumps, if you have, have this type of pump, it should be on a daily basis. And it doesn't, you don't have to sit there and count the number of drops in a, in a minute necessarily, but as you do your checks and your rounds, you glance at the pump, make sure that there's some leakage there and, and carry on. If there's no leakage, then some adjustments need to be made. Talk about mechanical seals. Oh, hang on, I got a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, somebody made a point about valves. Uh, you get a lot of a lot of sluice valves. Yes, I I, I agree that they're uh, depending on uh, the plants and their locations. They do use a lot of those. There's no question on mechanical seals, and and I'm gonna. That's the section we're on right now. You have to remember too that uh, when you write an exam, they get developed in, uh, over decades. Um, so there may be, your plant may use mechanical seals everywhere and not deal with packing anymore, which is similar to our facility. Um, but there will be questions about packing, how it's replaced, how it's adjusted. They will be on the exam. Uh, mechanical seals, uh, the question or the comment that's made, you're exactly right. Uh, this mechanical seal sits in here. Uh, if there was leakage on the shaft, you know the mechanical seal is gone. Uh, much better for maintenance, much easier. It's uh, the, the seats are here. So this is installed either way. You have the seat, which presses up together, maybe a Teflon seat that's in this valve. The spring keeps tension there. And, and they just operate with low maintenance, low, uh, low, low work to be done, which is great. If you see a leak or a problem, 
<coughs> excuse me, if you see a leak or a problem, then you know your mechanical seal is, is gone for sure. Um, typically, these seals, every time a pump is serviced, these seals are inspected. Um, more than likely, they'll be replaced at that time as well. It's really hard to see until, until there's a failure because this is all inside. So if you're going to take a pump out of service and serve and do this repair work, you may as well replace the mechanical seal because chances are that pump's going to remain in service for years before you have to look at it again. Uh, comment about in Dominica, they use ground fast and KSB submersible pumps. Uh, live. I'm not familiar with the KSB, but uh, definitely ground, ground fast uh, pumps are in our area as well. Okay, just want to touch, try and zoom, zoom this in a little bit. So it just, this one of the last sections we're going to talk about, or last things we're going to cover today. People talk about pump efficiencies and 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 how they work, and you know, people have a pump in and they have it in max power, and it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing, and that's basically all centered around the flow curve or the curve for these for a specific pump in a specific application. A centrifugal pump, for example. Discharge head, as it increases, your pump efficiency drops. So what, what, what they're saying is the more it has to, the longer it has to push the water, the higher it has to push the water, your discharge pressure or your feet of head is increasing. There is a certain point in time where the flow and the feet of head, that's exactly where that pump is designed to operate. As you centrifugal pump as you increase discharge head your efficiency is going down the more power is required to run that pump um, chances are you're going to at some point damage damage that equipment as well if you're running a, if you've doubled the discharge head on your uh, on your centrifugal pump you not only you're not just uh, reducing the flow curve now, <coughs> excuse me. Now it's more back pressure on the pump. You're going to cause cavitation. Cavitation is when the water inside that pump heats up to a point. It forms uh, bubbles that it, the, it heats up, and the bubbles explode, which cause pitting on the pump, and eventually will wear that will wear that impeller down. So the pumping efficiency. It's not only for power. It's for design of the pump. It's for the flow through the pump. Um, so when you install something or when you have something installed, the right pump for the right application is critically important. Okay, when you're starting stopping pumps, you know, I'm assuming that well, everyone's aware that if you're starting a sump pump, you need to make sure the valves are open. More importantly, on a positive displacement pump, you need to make sure the discharge valve is open. If the suction valve on a positive displacement pump was closed, you wouldn't move any fluid, <clears throat> but you wouldn't increase a, any pressure on the discharge side. If you're trying to pump against, uh, a closed discharge valve or a block, block pipe on the discharge, you're going to create pressure and you're going to blow something apart. That positive displacement pump wants to move X number of liquid every time it pumps, and it'll just keep building pressure, building pressure. Because the positive displacement pump is designed, no matter what type of pump, it has a cavity of water that's trying to move it's not allowing water to move backwards. So you're either going to wreck something in the pump or you're going to blow something pump uh, apart on the discharge side. A question, uh, question about packing. So it says, if there is no leakage, will you replace the packing more often? Um, 
for for no leakage, your first step would be to back the packing glands off, see if you can get some leakage through. Um, if you can, um, don't really have to replace the packing until the packing gland gets tight against its its housing, and you can't make any more adjustments. If you see no leakage, you want to pack back that packing gland off to allow some leakage through. If you back it off and you get no flow, you should take that piece of pump or that pump out of service. Chances are there's uh, something on the inside of the pump that's plugged off and not allowing any flow past that pack packing. Uh, when packing fails, if you can imagine, it's wrapped around the shaft. If it fails, it's going to allow more water out. If packing fails, it's not going to prevent water from flowing. Okay. The only thing that prevents water from flowing is if the pump side of the packing, if there's something that's plugged off there. So when packing fails, there'll be more and more water. You adjust the gland uh, down 100% and you can't get any more adjustment. That's when you'd have to replace that packing. Okay, I'm just a couple of quick things. So when you're when you're monitoring pumps and these these will be some questions on your exams for sure for sure uh, your day to day rounds or your checks keep an eye on things you want to make sure you read the gauges uh, um, take a look and see what's going on uh, listen look and feel are important when you're doing things you want to uh, if you walk by a pump if after you've walked by a pump for ten years you know how it sounds. Chances are you'll be able to walk into a room and you're going to hear something that's not, if there's something's wrong with the pump, you're going to hear something that's not quite right. You'll be able to pick it out right away. It's your job then just to go find out which piece of equipment is something that's not happening uh, or working as correctly as it should. Um, I'll be honest with you. It says here, you know, bearing and motor temperature is not by hand. That depends on the specific pieces of equipment. Uh, most smaller pumps, that's exactly how they're checked. Uh, people, uh, operators walk by, they'll touch the uh, impeller casing and touch the bearing. Uh, if they're not hot to the touch, then they continue on. If the volute was hot to the touch, it means that pump is cavitating and it needs to be uh, uh, looked at. Uh, bearings, if there's a lot of vibration on the unit or if they're high temperature, the bearings are either gone or they're on their way out. Larger pumps, larger uh, piece of equipment will have uh, uh, automatic sensors available for uh, vibration. I had a question, uh, what's, what sort of protection do you recommend that should be used on sewer pumps? In my country, we use float switches and overloads. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, most uh, medium to larger uh, equipment that we have, we uh, definitely have overloads for uh, uh, at MCC control switches for sure. Um, a lot of uh, we rather than float switches, we use uh, flow control. So if there is, uh, we monitor uh, flow through a piece of equipment. Uh, if there's no flow, then the uh, control system shuts that piece of equipment down. Um, float switches are, are, are we use in a lot in our lift stations. And basically what we do with our control system for those float switches is if the float is tipped for a long period of time to start the pump, after X amount of time, if it hasn't lowered that flow, there's either a very large influent flow allowing that pump not to keep up or there's something wrong with the pump. Uh, in our list stations, typically we have uh, multiple flow switches. So we'll have a low level that uh, shuts the pump off. We'll have a high level that starts the pump and a high, high level that would call somebody out or indicate a problem to an operator that that system wasn't working as it should. Um, question about are there humidity sensors and moisture sensors? Definitely in submersible pumps or submersible mixers, um, um, moisture sensors for sure. It's uh, it's interesting. We've uh, been dealing with a lot of bioreactor uh, submersible mixer failures at this point, and 
my maintenance staff keeps taking them out, rebuilding them, rebuilding them. And the interesting point is, is they did the internals of all the uh, mixer rebuilds. But where the power cable goes in, there's a uh, seal. And when they were looking at a seal, they're assuming it doesn't need to be replaced. The seal was part of the maintenance kit, but they were just discarding that seal. Uh, and we've been getting a lot of moisture alarms, moisture alarms. So now they've taken a step back and realized that, okay, if somebody's sending you a maintenance package, including seals for the cables, that when you're servicing that pump, you should replace all of those at the same time. So when it goes back in, you know that it's all been replaced. So yes, they do use moisture sensors for that. The idea is if there's moisture in an electrical piece of equipment uh, to shut the power off or shut that piece of equipment. <clears throat> shut that piece of equipment down that way water may continue to go into that electrical motor but it can be taken apart uh dried out cleaned up uh put back into service if you run it and it's submerged in a liquid or there's excessive moisture there then you're going to ruin that piece of equipment okay we're running uh just about at our end of time. I'm just uh, stop sharing. There we go. I, I realize a lot of information this morning. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. The next sessions are going to be covering a lot of information as well. Um, please uh, uh, use the link. Try and take a look at the PowerPoints. Um, I'll give you a, as an example. We covered six of the modules um, today. Uh, the next sessions, we probably will not be covering as many modules in, uh, in a session, but we're going to be doing uh, potential practice exams. We're going to be de dealing with uh, uh, treatment components, primary treatment, secondary treatment, uh, and they usually take a little more time, time to go through. Um, so before we wind up today, I hopefully hopefully it's beneficial. I, I you know like I said, I much prefer to do uh, 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 training face to face because it's nice to be able to interact with everyone together. I'm assuming I see a lot of black screens with microphones off, so hopefully everybody's still uh, still with me and uh, we're going through this. But is there any any questions before we wrap up today? Here we go. Oh, I had some questions. Hang on a second. Okay. Oh. No. Oh. Nicole, you had a. You yes, have your go hand ahead, Nicole. Go ahead. Hi, in the uh, in the coagulation bit that you went, you. I was wondering if the alum that is used for is it the same for wastewater treatment plants as it is for when you're doing water treatment uh yeah it's based alum is basically alum and they use the same it's the same alum that's used in either uh either facility for sure one thing that's uh interesting of note <clears throat> if your water plant is upstream from your wastewater plant and your water plant is using alum you actually reduce the cost of the wastewater plant. And we, we dealt, dealt with it in, in one of the municipalities in the valley here, because the water plant was using alum for coagulation. And it actually had helped coagulate the wastewater stream because they were discharging from the water plant to the sewer system. So basically you're already putting alum, a, a certain amount of alum in your, in your wastewater plant. So that just a, a point of interest, but yes, uh, to get back to your question, yes, it's the same alum that's used in either location. We also have a question from Kingsley Alexander. Go ahead, Kingsley. Hey, good morning. Morning. Uh, you said a while ago that um, low speed cause cavitation. So you want to try, um, get more clarification at what terms of low speed cause it, um, cavitation? Because here we use um, VFDs to control the speed of the pumps. So you want to know what values consider as low cavitation, will give low cavitation. Yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> the cavitation 
may or may not be at low speed or high speed. It, it, it's it's all based on uh, discharge head and whether it can move move that water through the pump. Um, VFDs are awesome. We use a lot of those. So variable frequency drive, <clears throat> great for control on, on, a, on a pump for sure. Uh, even with a VFD though, you need to be really careful that you're not operating too far outside the pump curve. Otherwise you potentially can get some cavitation or you're just causing a lot of wear and tear on the pump. But you're, you're absolutely right. VFDs are, are awesome for helping maintain, um, <clears throat> maintain equipment. Um, Typically, a VFD downstream of the, the VFD in the pump, you'd have a uh, some type of flow control. So you can that flow control is tied back to the VFD. So as the flow drops off, the VFD would increase to, and as the flow increases, the VFD would drop off to maintain your uh, flow flow rate. I'm assuming that's similar to what uh, uh, the situation you're talking about. Any other questions? So when you're uh, when you're reviewing the PowerPoints, we 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 went through the first uh, six uh, PowerPoints this morning again at a quick pace. We'll be going back doing some more math questions. Uh, we'll be doing a, two or three math questions probably each session that we go through. Uh, so if you have time to review the, the PowerPoints that went through, fantastic. If there's any questions, make sure you have them prepped for next week. Uh, we'll be looking at, I'm just taking a look at our sessions here. I would say in advance, you probably want to look at the next, uh, at least the next uh, four, four or five PowerPoints. So PowerPoint seven through 11 at a minimum in advance for the next session to get some uh, uh, advanced information. As well, after the second session, we'll be, uh, we'll be, I'll be circulating a, a practice exam to uh, allow people to uh, do that during the week that we're off and then we'll review the answers to that practice, uh, practice exam. Keon King, please go ahead. You have a question. Or Jordan, is it you? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, I still can't um, access the link that um, opens the PowerPoint. Um, I've been trying the whole session, but I cannot access it. Can yeah. You me? Okay, I will. I will attend to that immediately following the session. I, I think um, I will. I will. I will sort it out and send it to you. Uh, because we are keeping the record of everybody who's registered onto this call. So I'll have your email contacts and I will send it to you, as well as the recording, the video recording of the session will be sent to you later in the morning. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, that was my same question. Like, when will the PowerPoints be available and stuff? Yeah, so it was I, answered. Thank you. It, it seems you can't. I think you may have some. I have to get permissions, give you permissions to access it. So I'll sort it out as soon as we can. As far as you know, your eyesight. If you have any problems with those PowerPoints, um, um, I think you have access to them. We, we sorted our issue out yesterday, but it, I think you're right. It's probably just a permissions uh, problem. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, your time this morning. Hopefully there is some beneficial information. Um, definitely come prepared next time with any questions. Uh, if you have time to review what we did uh, took today and in advance um, looking at the next few PowerPoints would be fantastic. Um, in order to uh, get through everything that we need to in these 12 sessions, we do have to cover a lot of time. And I wanna make sure that we have time to uh, go through those practice exams because they're great. Uh, at the beginning, the majority of the people that answered are, are ready for a level one exam. So these are great preparation for that. They're, they're not, at the course, the questions, the exams are not designed for the exam you're going to write. They're not based on that. 
Uh, it's not the same exam you're going to write by any means, but it gives you a really good insight on the types of questions, how questions are answered and, and are asked and, and the things you need to look for when you're, when you're answering them. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next Thursday morning. Um, take care and have a great day. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. And um, have a wonderful day, everyone. And as promised, we will be sending you all the information that you need for the course. Have a good day. Bye.